In this video, we're talking about intramolecular forces and potential energy. So let's review first what a chemical bond is. A chemical bond is an attraction between the nucleus of one atom and the electrons of another. So in this case, we have a balance between an attraction and repulsion. Okay, so attraction is when you have that proton-electron interaction, and repulsion is when you have a proton-proton or electron-electron interaction. Okay, so remember, opposites attract. So when we have a chemical bond, we are looking at the attraction between the nucleus, which is positive, and the electrons, which are negative. And you can also have repulsion going on at the same time. So you have proton-proton interaction between the two nuclei, and then you have electron-electron interaction between the electrons of atoms. Okay, so again, we're trying to find the balance between the attraction and the repulsion. It's like the Goldilocks zone. All right, so let's take a look at one of these graphs. Now, I know this, this looks super busy. We got a lot going on here, okay? So we have on our y-axis, we have potential energy. On our x-axis, we have internuclear distance. So if you notice, on our x-axis, the bond length is represented with the distance. Okay, so as I move to the right, the distance is increasing. Those nuclei are getting further and further apart. As I move to the left, as I move to the left, the nuclei of two atoms are getting closer. On the y-axis, as I move down, there is a negative attraction. So the um, nuclei and the electrons of the opposite atoms are attracting and getting closer together. As I move to, as I move up, there's a repulsion going on. So the nuclei of the two atoms are pushing each other away or the electrons on opposite atoms are pushing each other away. Okay, so we want to find kind of that sweet distance between attraction and repulsion and get that like Goldilocks zone. Okay, so when potential energy is zero, oops, when potential energy is zero, so when we're right on the y-axis, there is no attraction or repulsion. Okay, so when we dip below when we dip below that zero point right there, we are experiencing attraction. When we go above the zero mark, we're experiencing repulsion. When we're on the zero mark, there is neither attraction or repulsion. Okay. When potential energy is at its lowest point, so right, oops, so right down here on our graph, when it's at its lowest, that is a stable arrangement. So you have that sweet Goldilocks zone where you have a balance between attraction and repulsion. Okay. So this is literally everything I just said right here. Two terms that you need to know though. We have bond energy, which is the energy required to break the bonds. And then you have bond length, which is the distance between the atoms. Okay. So I like to represent bonds with rubber bands. So if you think about it, if you had, well, let's say you had two points here and you had one rubber band, you could stretch that rubber band out really, really far. Okay. It could go really, really, really far. So it's going to have a lot of distance and it doesn't take a lot of energy. So in a single bond, it doesn't take a lot of energy to break, but you can stretch it out really far. In a double bond, so again, you have two rubber bands. You can't stretch it out as far because you're working against two rubber bands. And it takes a lot more energy to break those bonds. And if you have three rubber bands, uh, it's very difficult to break three rubber bands, especially if you've got them wrapped around your fingers and you're trying to break them. Three rubber bands is really hard to break and you can't stretch it very far. So again, with a single bond, you are going to have the longest bond. So if you put a rubber band between two points and you try to stretch it out, it's going to stretch really far, but it's going to have an easy time breaking. 
you're going to be able to break it very easily because you're only working against one rubber band. With a triple bond, again, you're not going to be able to stretch it out very far, and it's going to take a lot of energy to break those rubber bands when you've got three that you're working against. Bonds work exactly the same way. And of course, a double bond would be in the middle. So ionic bond occurs when you have electrostatic attraction between a positive cation and a negative anion, so essentially a metal and a non-metal on the periodic table. Interactions between cations and anions can be explained with Coulomb's law. So on Coulomb's law, we're talking about the force, and we have two particles. Okay, so we have the charge of particle one, we have the charge of particle two, and then r squared is the distance between the particles. So let me just draw a quick diagram here. So we have two particles. So this would be q1, this would be q2. And the distance between the particles is the radius. Okay, so think about your refrigerator at home, right? So you have your refrigerator and you have a refrigerator magnet, okay? The magnet is obviously attracted to the refrigerator. Now I know magnets and charges are not the same thing, but actually Newton's law of universal gravitation and Coulomb's law follow the same format, we just have different variables. Okay, so it works exactly the same. So your refrigerator magnet, as you bring it closer to the refrigerator, the attraction is stronger. So if you're reducing the radius, making the radius smaller, the attraction is stronger. The force increases. So as the radius goes down, the force goes up. They have an inverse relationship. Now, with the particles... If you had a bigger magnet, so let's say I took my magnet, my refrigerator magnet, and I made it a lot bigger, obviously you're going to feel a lot stronger of a pull if we have a bigger magnet. So if I took one of these cues and made it bigger, I'm going to experience a greater force. They have a direct relationship. So that is how Coulomb's Law works. And that's true when we have particles. Bigger particles, stronger attraction. More distance, between the particles, less of an attraction. All right, let's interpret this graph here. So we have three different types of bonds. We have a single bond, we have a double bond, and we have a triple bond. So just to make this a little bit easier to understand, our zero point is right here. So this is zero, so our energy actually increases as we go down. Okay, so more energy is down here. Okay, so we're looking at the potential energy graph that we were looking at earlier like this. Okay, so again, I'm talking like we're looking at the lower half, so we're looking at this part of our graph here. Okay, so let's go back and Take a look at the bonds, okay? So bond C, okay? So bond C, so I'm looking at this one right here. That would be a single bond, okay? Now, if we looked at all three of these curves together, you could easily identify that as a single bond, okay? So if you notice, it has, of the three, let me just kind of bring this down, taking the lowest point of each curve and I'm bringing it down to the x-axis. So it has the most distance between the nuclei of the three, followed by B and then A. Okay. Now if I took that same point and brought it over to the y-axis, remember our energy is increasing as we go down. So C would have the least energy of the three, followed by B and then A. So if you got a question where you got three curves on a graph and you had to identify the single, double, and triple bond. You could easily do it based on what you know about the bonds and then looking at where they are on the curve. So let's look at an example. It says the energy required to separate the ions in the magnesium hydroxide crystal lattice into individual magnesium and hydroxide ions, as represented in the table below, is known as lattice energy of magnesium oxide. So we're basically taking this compound and we're separating it into its ions. As shown in the table, the lattice energy of strontium hydroxide is less than the lattice energy of magnesium hydroxide. 
explain why in terms of periodic properties and Coulomb's law. So again, the magnesium hydroxide takes more energy to separate than the strontium hydroxide. Why? Well, let's take a look at our periodic table. Okay, so on our periodic table, we're looking at magnesium, which is in the third period here. And if we go down to strontium, it's in the fifth period. Okay, so obviously magnesium is much smaller. So magnesium, I think we said is in the third. So it's gonna have three shells here, whereas strontium is in the fifth. So it's going to be much, much bigger. Okay, so the valence electrons in strontium are much, much, much further from the nucleus. So it's gonna require less energy to be able to separate out the ions, okay? Whereas with magnesium, the valence electrons are much closer to the nucleus, so there's a much tighter pull on those. All right, let's go down and look at another example. It says, the potential energy diagram is given for a triple bond between carbon and oxygen. A student claims that a curve for a single carbon-oxygen bond would be less and deep uh, and would be shifted to the right of the curve for a triple bond between carbon and oxygen. Do you agree with this claim? Why or why not? Okay, so we have a triple bond and we have a single bond. So we know that triple bonds, so our triple bond here, is going to be short, shorter, so it's going to have a smaller radius and it's going to need more energy. compared to our carbon oxygen single bond, okay, which will be longer and have less energy. All right, so we've got a curve here and let's just kind of plot our own curve down here. So, and let's maybe use some different colors. So let's say this one's gonna be green and this one will be blue. Okay, so uh, we should probably label our axes. So this will be distance or radius, and then this will be energy. All right, so let's throw a point on our graph here. Okay, so we wanna have it be shorter and then more energy. So it would be peaking down here. And then our um, single bond, it's going to be longer and it's going to have less energy. So it will be peaking here. So our graph would look something like this. And then this graph would look something like this. Right? Um, okay, so the CO bond would be less deep. So this claim right here, I agree with, okay? Because if you look at the graph, it is definitely less deep when compared to our triple bond. And then it would be shifted to the right of the curve for the triple bond, which I also agree with. So I agree with the student. We plotted both curves on our graph and it matches up with our understanding.